Hey guys, this is John with Ford Talk again here, and we have with us today Jason Weatherly, a very good friend of mine, and we are excited to have him on the uh, on the program today. So we are just going to be talking for a few minutes. This is not structured at all. This is just a couple of old friends having a conversation, and you get to watch. So, Jason, welcome to Forward Talk. Thank you, John. It's good to good to get to talk with you. We get to text quite often, but it's a rare occasion in our busy lives to get to talk face to face. And when we do now, the whole world is watching. So, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> I think it was the year 2000 whenever I had my first debate and you were there as well in Alton, Illinois. Yeah, it was about that time. Um, we had actually met prior to that. Was it Jack's Creek, Tennessee? Yeah, my recollection is that we've we've known each other for uh, this is you know part of that we're now on the uh, the peak and the downward slope of being a couple of old men. Yeah. Uh, so I, as far as I know, and I kind of base everything upon my children's ages. So I know that we have known each other for more than twenty five years. Yeah. And then out of that, we've been uh, friends for the past 20 years. Yeah. And, and then we've, our, our friendship has gotten even closer in probably the last 15 years. Yes, um, sir. I, I know that, uh, and I'm not, I don't mean to speak for you, but I, to, but to be presumptuous, I, I, I would say that we're two of the closest friends. I consider John Carroll to be one of my best friends. Absolutely. Uh, out of everybody, uh, ministers and, and non-ministers alike. So, and, I, I've even got, well, we're so good at friends. I've even got disfellowship by a few people because <laughs> we're still that's friends. So. That's crazy. Well, and the same thing with, uh, you know, people will ask me questions of, about John Carroll. And before I answer them, I'm like, why do you want to know? Exactly. Uh, this, is this one of those I'm going to need to take you around to the, the back of the tool shed kind of questions? Don't be trying to diss my friend. <laughs> that's I'll, right. Uh, I, I got my friends back. <laughs> uh, the first, my first memory of talking with you in person is in Jack's was at camp meeting in Jack's Creek, Tennessee. I don't know that that was the first time, but that was, that's definitely my first memory. Well, either I remember that vaguely, but I, and I don't know which one came first, but I also remember being at a camp meeting. I say a camp meeting, an anniversary service where Johnny James was uh, teaching the day service. And BB. I remember that, that you were there. Now, whether that came before Jack's Creek or that was after Jack's Creek, I don't remember. Well, uh, they would have both been, uh, I think. May have I even been the same year. It could have very. Because the anniversary service would have been like maybe April, March or April of that year. And then Jack's Creek camp meeting was always. What I, and what I remember about that Johnny James day service was, uh, he was he used being at a Bulls game and <laughs> watching Michael Jordan play. Yeah. As yeah. an illustration in the sermon and uh uh <laughs> there was a little bit of a uh this is not necessarily the views of the local radio station <laughs> yes. kind of yeah. exception made after the sermon was over. That was so Yeah. Funny. He could uh he could feel the uh the, the tension in the air when he mentioned organized professional sports, that's, uh, that's most unfortunate, but either way. <laughs> <laughs> but he was classic Johnny James that day. Oh yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. It was awesome. So we obviously, uh, it was in 2000 when I had my first debate, it was in June of 2000, if I remember correctly. And I was debating Pat, uh, not Pat Donahue. I was debating Tommy Thrasher, and you debated Pat Donahue. Correct. It was my defer first debate, but it was not your first debate. You had debated multiple times before that that June debate in 2000. Yeah, I got into debates um, real early in my walk with 
with God. Uh, I was not raised in church. My, my parents were hippies. My dad was a pothead and a, a drug dealer. My mom was an alcoholic. I, I came into the faith in um, late 1990 and was baptized in Jesus' name, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in February of 1991. And then just about a year later, uh, I attended a, a debate in Memphis, Tennessee, and it was Billy Lewis, who was a UPCI preacher. Uh, the church that he pastored then is the the area that Caleb Adams now pastors, the, okay. the, the Frazier area of Memphis, Tennessee. And it was a debate on uh, miraculous gifts. Billy Lewis was debating... Um, Bill Lockwood. You remember Bill Lockwood? I know you remember Bill Lockwood because you were at that debate where he brought the uh, the snake in the two liter bottle for Garrett, and, and, and he Garrett, threatened to kill. He threatened yeah, to kill yeah, Christian Garrett. Yeah, Garrett, <laughs> Garrett acted like he was going to open it, and Lockwood took that pointer. I'll pierce you through the heart. I'll pierce you through the heart. <laughs> but uh, so that was my first debate ever, and here I am, a new convert, and everything about me is you know kind of this line in the sand truth because I wasn't yeah. raised any type of denomination. So when I came to the Lord, it was a search for truth. And so when I saw this real line, and by that, you don't mean the flip chart Bible study. No, no, no. I don't mean the, <laughs> but we did have, we, we did go through that uh, afterwards, but um, everything to me is, you know, it's acts, you know, Deuteronomy six and four is truth. Acts two thirty eight is truth. And um, you know, the, the, this oneness Christianity is, the faith kind of ideology. So anyway, I, I really just adhere to this debate uh, concept. I saw it as a form of evangelism Absolutely. because I looked around that, that United Pentecostal church in Memphis and it was packed full of people that are not Pentecostal. They're, they're Trinitarians. Uh, and so from that, I got involved uh, helping out in debates. Uh, I'm an artist. And back then you know, it was the old, transparencies. So you're having to either type or hand, hand draw a chart. Um, and then through uh, Garrett, I think it was, he, he had probably debated Stephen Wiggins and Wiggins was friends with this guy named John Lewis, who was uh, an evangelist with the church of Christ in um, Lone Grove, o Oklahoma. And he was interested in getting into debates but he wanted to debate someone that had never debated before. So he and I hooked up and it was like, do you know what year that was? Maybe 1995. Um, I know I was 22 at the time, which okay. is a, a very young age. Uh, as far as I know, the youngest age of any apostolic to debate in modern times. So that was my first two debates with uh, John Lewis on cessationism. We were debating miraculous gifts. And then shortly after that, uh, we even had a written debate on the exact same subject. And then before uh, 2000, I had debated um, Tommy Thrasher and Pat Donahue on a weekend uh, on debated Tommy Thrasher on the Godhead music in the church. And then I debated Pat Donahue on the baptismal formula and spiritual gifts. So I had already had about, eight different debates by the time we got around to uh, the debate in Alton, Illinois. And uh, um, that, that was my very first debate that I had had was in Alton, Illinois. And I ended up debating uh, Tommy Thrasher again in Winsboro or in Monroe, Louisiana. Well, actually Winsboro and Monroe. The first part of the debate was in Winsboro. The second part was in Monroe. And uh, then I ended up debating uh, Pat Donahue on first day of the week, Lord's Supper. And what I think is the only debate on uh, the impeccability of Christ that's out there. I think. Well, it's impeccable. So there doesn't need to be another. <laughs> <laughs> Won't have to be another one. What's, what's amazing is uh, your debate with, with Pat on uh, the impeccability. And for those watching, that's like, what are you talking about? Impeccability. It's the, uh, it's the idea of could Jesus have sinned? It's a debate on that. And it really has to, it boils down to a lot to the humanity and the, the deity of Jesus Christ. But that debate, um, you know, the, the online Bible program, ESORD? Yeah. 
people can create modules for eSword and you can go through eSword's link and it takes you to a totally different website where you can download free modules. Your debate with Pat is a free module on eSword. <laughs> that's amazing. So that's, that's how, uh, it, and I don't think the person that did the module is, uh, is oneness. So that's how influential that debate is uh, to that's, other people. That's pretty, that's pretty incredible. And then I debated uh, <clears throat> Wayne Burkett in Missouri on uh, eternal security and the essentiality of water baptism. And uh, I think that's the, uh, oh, I had a, also had a written debate with Pat Donahue on divorce and remarriage way back in the day too. But so we are just a couple of old cantankerous argumentative <laughs> fussy old men. So, well, that's what they like to make us out to be is cantankerous but it, argumentative, but it's, that's not the case yeah, at all. It's not that at all. I tell people all the time, I'm very approachable and, and we're both very likable, nice guys. Of but uh, when it comes to defending what we believe, we are both very lying in the sand. Um, and Dr. Norris, uh, just to let the listeners know, I'm currently working on my master's of divinity through Urshan Graduate School. Uh, I'm in Systematic Theology too with Dr. David Norris, and I got to address the class uh, just a few months ago about uh, the issue of uh, women's place in the church. And when Dr. Norris in introduced me to the class, he's like, you know, Brother Weatherly, he's got a very line in the sand approach, and when you cross him, heads will roll. That's <laughs> so that's, that's kind of, I, I, I get that because of my, you know, my history of being a debater, but in reality, we're you and I are both very approachable, uh, likable, easygoing guys. But Absolutely. when it comes to truth, yeah, truth is truth. <laughs> and it's been a number of years since I've debated personally, but I don't know how but the last maybe five or six or eight of your debates I've I've been there to moderate for you. Yeah. Um, so the last, let's see. Well, I mean, if you include Alton. So those would be, you've helped moderate those. And yeah. I debated in Alton, uh, Pat Donahue on the baptismal formula and uh, gifts of the spirit. Then here in Arkansas, back in, man, I don't remember how long ago it was, but it was Bruce Reeves. And we debated two nights on the Godhead, two nights on uh, the baptismal formula. And then back around 2012, I debated uh, Kevin Pendergrass two nights on instrumental music in the church. And then it was 2018 or 2019. I forget which one it was either 2018 or 2019. I debated uh, Bishop Jerry Hayes on the issue of head coverings, long hair versus head coverings. And that was up in uh, Lepanto, Arkansas, where Jonathan Neely pastors. One of my favorite parts of moderating <clears throat> One of my favorite parts of moderating debates for you was helping plan puns for the <laughs> for the Reeves debate. <clears throat> I was like, dude, he has that green Bauart and Gingrich Danker <laughs> commentary on his table. You have to look at him and say, uh, I know it's green, but that ain't kryptonite, Mr. That Reeves. ain't kryptonite, <laughs> Mr. Reeves. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you'll remember this one. Uh, <clears throat> even when we were debate when I was debating Pat Donahue and we were talking about the partial versus the whole uh -huh. you would set the chart up there and you covered part of it with the, uh, with a piece of paper. And you're like, we're going to give you the partial. Then we're going to give you the whole. I mean, <laughs> it was just, and, and for people that don't know us, we've been friends long enough that we have that repertoire to where, yeah. you know, one of us can set it up and the other one can bowl it down or, or vice versa. Uh, and, uh, and then what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Now, yeah, take a gander at <laughs> yeah yeah or anytime someone wants to when i debate any and this is uh i know it's going to come up because i'm a licensed united pentecostal minister they're always going to quote david bernard yeah. they're going to try to find somewhere where yeah. david bernard says something that's contrary and and they're it it always comes out to be they're taking dr bernard out of context so i will always have a chart about Dr. Bernard, and I'll make some comment about, you know, they want to quote one of our big dogs, St. Bernard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that always gets kind of a, a, 
a laugh from the audience. And that's, that was one of the things I liked about Billy Lewis. Uh, Billy Lewis had a, he was very scholarly, but he also had a, a humorous approach to, it, it wasn't all just punching people in the face, spiritually speaking. And the same thing with uh, Gordon McGee. You know, his yeah. debate, the Toddy McGee debate is, well, that's my, my favorite, mind, my favorite debate of all time to listen to. Yeah, And it's, it's always going to be the greatest Godhead debate. It's uh, academic, absolutely. it's scholarly, but it's, it's fun to listen to. Yeah. Uh, Gordon McGee's Irish wit is just unparalleled. Yeah. And wouldn't, uh, Toddy was Mr. Toddy. <laughs> Mr. Toddy. He would say things, uh, Toddy would say things like, uh, you know, I've debated DL Welch and, Gordon McGee would refer respond back to it. He says, Mr. Toddy says he's debated the best. He doesn't want to debate the Irish. He wants to debate the Welch. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then <laughs> Yeah, he had he had some uh, he had some classic classic lines in that debate. And of course his accent just yep. was entertaining to the next level. So yeah. it's a lot of times in debate you gotta you know you're you're preparing, you're over preparing for what's going to come in the debate. <clears throat> and so I'll throw in some humorous charts. And, and I've had, like in my first debate with John Lewis, I knew that the issue of, uh, well, if you really have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, then perform a miracle like yeah. the apostles did. So I had the, the chart called the chicken coop. Yeah. And at the top of the chart, <clears throat> I had drawn these chicken bodies. But on the heads, instead of having chicken heads, I drew various heads. So one was a Pharisee and had the, you know, the Pharisee head covering. Uh, one was a face that looked all black and blue, and that's the thief on the cross. Then I had a, a head that was on fire, and that's the rich man in hell. Then I had a, the last chicken is I drew a picture of the guy I was debating. And it was very obvious that was his face. Oh, yeah. You're um, a good artist. So it was no doubt. You did the same thing with Bruce Reeves, too. Yeah, I did the same thing. with And with Bruce, I did the uh, – um, Bruce has uh, one wife and three persons. Yeah. So if, if Bruce can worship one God in three persons, can he have one wife in three persons? Yeah. So I drew, I drew Bruce, and around him were these – these three <laughs> luscious ladies. Daphne. One of them was uh, Daphne from uh, Scooby-Doo. The other one was uh, Betty Rubble from the Flintstones. And then the last one was Blondie from Dagwood and Blondie. So he had a redhead, a brunette, and a blonde. And so the, you know, the concept is, if you can believe in one God and three persons, can you have one wife and three persons? They all share the same nature. They... That's, yeah, it's one woman nature, one, one wife hood. Uh, and then I, I made the connection that uh, one wife and three persons is polygamy just as much as one God and three persons is, is polytheism. Yeah. You know, whether, whether they admit that or not, ultimately that's where uh, Trinitarianism goes. And, you know, even uh, Millard yeah, that Erickson. Was first, <clears throat> that was the first debate where I've ever seen somebody completely ignore a point of order. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't remember what that guy's name was. It was his moderator. His moderator. Oh, the other uh, great part in that debate was whenever you were quoting one of his church of Christ brethren, and you were just coming down on the, on the line where his, one of his own brethren disagreed with his position on one of those key points. I forget what the point was and we didn't know it. And, and the guy you were quoting was sitting right there on the front row. Yeah, that was, um, oh, what was that guy's name? I can see his face, but yeah, he's, uh, he had a debate. It is lasting sort of the a, uh, you can probably hear my German cuckoo clock going off in the background. Uh, what was his name? Anyway, they had a debate. This conversation's for the birds. <laughs> that was a gift from my son, Caleb, who is stationed in Germany. He's a um, specialist in the Army, and he's a, a geospatial engineer. So for Christmas, he sent me that cuckoo clock, and uh, people in the house would be like, why don't you just turn the, the cuckoo off? And I'm like, no, I don't like to hear it. So. Uh, it makes me feel a little anyway, less crazy. Uh, he, the guy's from Texas, wasn't he? I forget where he was from. Jeff Asher. That's his yeah, name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeff Asher. So uh, there was the Asher Bonner debate in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And these were two Church of Christ guys debating on 
the humanity of Jesus. And the point was uh, Philippians 2, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal yes. with God. Yes. And where a lot of Trinitarians will say that that's pre-existence, uh, Jeff Asher was pointing out that that was yes. not pre-existence. It's a, a reference to the incarnation. And so I pulled that. And yeah, I didn't know Jeff Asher. I had never even met Jeff Asher. And he's sitting front and center in that debate. It was so hilarious. And when we found out, when we found that out, the body language and the awkward <laughs> was so awesome. Yeah. What, <laughs> one of my other favorite things, it wasn't even my debate. Uh, Jonathan Neely, had he debated a young Church of Christ preacher oh, in there. the Northeast Arkansas area. And you were there. You were in the audience. Um, because in the, they debated the baptismal formula, and one of the questions Brother Neely asked him was, in uh, Mark nine forty nine, how did John know that the stranger cast out demons in Jesus' name? Because in Mark nine forty nine, John comes to Jesus and he says, "Master, we saw one casting out yeah. de devils in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us." So how did they know he cast out demons in Jesus' name? If he was not orally invoking the name. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the context is obvious. He knew he did it because he invoked the name. And uh, Brother Neely couldn't get the guy to answer the question. And so I, I was moderating for Brother Neely, and I told him, I said, you've got to press the issue that this guy has not answered that question. And so finally, in his last speech, the guy said, you know, he apologized. I'm sorry I didn't answer the question. He goes, but to answer the question, the, the way John knew that the stranger cast out demons in Jesus' name is because John heard him say that. And when he did, with just a you know, knee-jerk reaction, I'm sitting over the side, and I'm like, touchdown! <laughs> and the whole audience, when they saw me, they're like, oh! And you could see the whole, like even the Church of Christ people, their eyes were like, oh, oh, okay, I get what they're saying now. And, and even after the debate, the guy's wife was telling him, hey, now, if this is what that in the name of Jesus means in this passage, then why aren't we baptizing like this, like like these guys are? So, exactly that that wasn't that was an amazing moment. And uh, so, are there any uh, debates coming up in the near future? I don't have any any debates coming up in the future. Um, I d I get asked several times. Uh, uh, Pat recently reached out to me. He was going to be in somewhere in Tennessee and asked if. If I wanted to meet together. But what's funny is apparently I had a debate scheduled last year that I didn't know anything about. Uh, I'm sitting in eschatology class at Urshan June of last year, and my phone starts blowing up text messages and screenshots because there's this guy on Facebook, and I don't know if the guy's delusional uh, or, or deceptive or a little bit of both. Uh, so I'm not even going to justify saying his name or the, the Facebook page, but he's got this Facebook page and he's, he claims that a few years ago he got this revelation, you know, after many days of prophesying, he got this revelation that uh, baptism in the name of Jesus is, is not that the, the baptizer invokes the name over the candidate, but it's that the candidate says it over one, himself. Yeah. He invokes the name for himself. And he connects that with uh, in Acts twenty two sixteen that the calling is directly linked with wash away thy sins, and so the way he he now interprets this is that unless the person being baptized invokes the name of Jesus for themselves, then they were not baptized for the remission of sins, and so he started rebaptizing people having the candidate invoke the name for themselves. So anyway, he started this Facebook page. Uh, I was on it for a while. And when I challenged him on his ideology, well, he not only kicked me off his page, he blocked me totally on Facebook. And he's done the same thing to Clayton Killian, uh, Kevin Shaw, anybody that seems to, to know Greek and challenge this guy. So last year around June, he, he goes on his Facebook page that I'm not even a member of, and I can't even see because I'm blocked, announcing that he and I are going to have a debate on the baptismal formula issue. So I'm, I'm sitting in eschatology class, and I'm getting these texts. Hey, man, are you, you going to debate this guy? He's, he's saying you're going to have a debate. 
And, you know, to illustrate how asinine that is, is that'd be like me announcing I'm going to have a debate with James White on the Godhead yeah. next weekend, and James White doesn't know anything about it. Exactly. So not only do I not know anything about it, I can't because I can't see this guy's post. He's blocked me on Facebook. So what I did is I emailed the guy. I just emailed him directly. And I, uh, so he has my email address. I put my personal phone number on there and I just told him, you know, here you are announcing that you and I are going to have a debate. You've, you've set up this paper tiger to make yourself look like this, this bold hunter when in reality you're, you're a coward. And I straight up called him a coward. Uh, said if you if you want to debate me, then you you come to me. And yeah. you know it was some janky propositions that that I would have never written anyway. So uh, I sent so I, I sent him propositions. I said here's here's what we could debate. I'll debate, resolve the scriptures teach that in order for baptism to be valid, the name of Jesus must be invoked by the baptizer, which is the exact same proposition I've defended at least four, if not five times in public debate. And then I sent him the proposition, um, resolve the scriptures teach that in order for baptism to be valid, the name of Jesus must be invoked by the one being baptized. And he said that he would not affirm that he wanted to affirm something different. And that that's where the conversation ended. I haven't heard back from this guy yet. He's, he went all over Facebook telling people that, that I backed out of a debate and all of this, which is, it's not true. I mean, the guy's just a coward and a liar, but so I don't have any debates scheduled, but yeah. apparently there was this fictitious debate that I was supposed to have last year that I, I didn't know anything about, but. Uh, well, I definitely want to do it again. And uh, I, I honestly really want to engage in some, some uh, debates with some apostolic guys as well over some in-house topics, some intramural uh, debates that I think that we really need to talk about in the apostolic movement, and to debate as brothers, kind of, kind yeah. of, kind of like Michael, Doctor Michael Brown, and, and and Dr. James White debating each other. They they team up and debate on the on the same team as friends, and they are very good personal friends. But they've also had debates against each other over topics where they disagree and they they demonstrate i think in an incredible way how to to disagree as brothers and as friends and i think that needs to happen within our movement and i actually have a article that i wrote on my blog on called apostolics need to debate and the problem is is that we chew each other up already we just do it behind each other's oh, back we yeah. do it around conference tables when the guy that we're opposing isn't sitting there yeah and we're we're having the conversations any anyway. I just think we need to bring them out of, you know, out of back rooms and and conference tables and bring them out in the opening open and do it where it's respectful and honorable and in a way in which everybody can see the conversation. Yeah, and we kind of did that uh, a year or so ago with Bishop Hayes. Yes, exactly. Because, right. because Bishop Hayes, uh, he is. He uh, baptized us two thirty eight one God believer. Absolutely. He was a prolific debater. One of the in, he has the nineteen eighties. He has some of the best academic uh defenses of the oneness of God in terms yeah. of his old old school debates. He I mean he's he had some great debates with Church of Christ guys. Yeah. Some amazing. Yeah, debates. he and Steve and Hancock fact, were Thrasher says that that Hayes was the most formidable Godhead opponent that he that Oh wow. He, yeah, I, I know that uh, Bishop Hayes and Steve Hancock were real good friends, and, and they debated together in the in the 80s. So Somebody even recently suggested ho hosting an eschatology forum where you and I would both be present to present our uh, respective views on eschatology. And yeah, I would be fine with that, but it would probably be a little boring for the audience because it, wasn't, it wouldn't be as uh, divisive on the disagreement yeah exactly. because uh you know although we have uh we view different nuances of eschatology different some of the greater schemes we We're agree upon on the exact same page yeah. so you know as far as like dispensationalism neither one of us are are dispensationalist yeah we're it's not just, only non-dispensationalist we are 
at least I am anti anti dispensational. Oh yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> and neither one of us hold a hold a hold the gap theory of no of uh, of Daniel seventy weeks, right? Um, and, and technically, both of us are believe a a post tribulation exactly. tribulation rapture view. And I was I was raised with basically the C George um, style post trib. Uh, eschatology yeah and which is where which which is what informs my view of daniel 70 weeks and a whole list of other places where we where we agree yeah uh, the difference is is that i let that develop that developed out for me to the point where i see the great tribulation as having occurred in ad 70 and the destruction of jerusalem and you still see it as uh, a future event yeah I could see, and and both of us respect the other other one's view as if Absolutely. you know if it's not a uh, like like I'll say this I I would have more res- I have more respect for both partial preterism and a historicist view than I do for preter full preterism yeah and pre tribulation rapture yeah uh, both of those and when you say wait you're you're comparing preterism to pre tribulation rapture. I'm saying that both of those to me are absolutely not even on the table of discussion for, for eschatology. Same uh, for me. <clears throat> to, to me, the only views worth looking at are that post-trib and post trib, partial yeah. preterist, or a historicist view. Yeah. Like uh, Sam Storm, he yeah. holds uh, he holds more of a I, I think he would he would agree with you on Matthew 24 yeah. uh, that the, the division is like on verse 36, I believe the, the, the prior oh, that hour knoweth no man. Yes. Yeah. That's the shift to the second yeah, coming second coming. Yeah. But he would hold his view of revelation is that it's the, his, he holds the historicist view. Yeah. That Whereas it's I, the, I hold the view that it's, uh, it's the missing Olivet discourse from the Gospel of John, that it's it's the it's John's Olivet discourse in apocalyptic language, and so that apparently he had to be told twice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and see, this is where people watching this can be they can go, oh well, they poke fun at each other. Yeah, we do. We we poke fun at each other because absolutely because uh, I'm like, uh, <laughs> wasn't John there the first time? Oh, he had to be told twice. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, we, we agree on the, on the big points and it's a, it's a small, I, it's a short step to take to um, go from a post-trib view to the partial preterist view. Yeah. And to be clear for anybody that's watching, like I affirm one thousand percent if that's possible that the literal <clears throat> bodily visible physical second coming of christ resurrection from the dead occurs in the future that those are future events that did not take place in eighty seventy. Yep. And, one and of the I things i've run into is that there is a a big misunderstanding in our ranks of eschatology i was in eschatology class um last june and my present and and this is no slur toward my professor whatsoever dr norris is a scholar he holds a pre-tribulation uh partial dispensational view he's not like an extreme dispensationalist um, and he's pre-millennial so when we got in the class and uh i I won't mention any of the brothers in the class but some of them were are hold positions on the general board Mm -hmm. Uh, one one guy in particular his father-in-law is one of the biggest prophecy teachers in the upci so people connecting the dots don't know exactly who i'm talking about but one of the things came up about daniel 70 weeks and they mentioned that if you believe that daniel 70 weeks was fulfilled in calvary well then you're a preterist No, no 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 and i was like no no those are not identical doctrines they're, no, they're no, totally no. two different doctrines. And then the next as a, day, as, the a same. Post-trib, as a post trib pre millennial, as a pre millennial post trib futurist, 
yeah, <clears throat> the the way I grew up, we we taught strongly that Daniel seventy weeks was fulfilled, and yeah. that was a pre mill futurist post tribber. Yeah. Well, then I ended up giving my presentation. No one there knew that. I mean, it was just whether you want to say the Lord worked it out in that class or whatever. Uh, I figured it was going to come up anyway, but I gave my presentation on Daniel 70 weeks and, you know, not just patting myself on the back or anything, but when I was done, the students in the class that had questioned before looked at me and said, brother Weatherly, that makes more sense than anything I've ever heard. Yeah. And one of the brothers had a study Bible and he said, and in the study Bible, it, it gave both views, the gap theory dispensational and the non-dispensational. And he said, my study Bible says that what you just presented on Daniel 70 weeks is the traditional view. And I'm like, yes, this is how Bible scholars for thousands of years have explained Daniel 70 weeks and dispensationalism is a new belief. It's barely a hundred now it's probably a hundred years old, but it's a hundred years old. But then I ran into the same thing the next day when we got to talking about the millennium, you know, they, something was mentioned about a millennialism and they were like, well, a millennialism is preterist. And I'm like, no. no, it's not. You've got entire denominations as a whole that are a millennial, uh, Roman Catholics, any kind of ortho, Eastern Orthodox type church are all a millennial, a millennial. Um, Lutherans, uh, Presbyterians, of Church of Christ, or a Church of Christ. A lot of Baptists are all a millennial, but they all, as a whole, believe in the literal second coming of Jesus Christ. Future, bodily. future, yeah. Physical. So they're not, yeah, they're not preterist whatsoever. Absolutely. And and those fringe groups that are preterist are looked upon as being, you know, the brethren in error yeah. kind of, you know, the unorthodox guys. So I was like, we, we need just to be able to uh, at least present honestly what these views are and don't, yeah. you know, either you're being ignorant in associating a millennialism with preterism yeah. or preterism, you're using it as a scare tactic. Preterism is to, to Pentecostals what uh, homophobe is in the political world. If we get yeah. <laughs> If we could just throw, if we could just label you a preterist, then you're oh. obviously this. Yeah. Here. Anything we don't understand because it's not what we've heard taught in our local congregation is, oh, that must be preterist. Exactly. You, you believe it's funny. It's funny he shall confirm a covenant with many is, is the Lord confirming the new covenant. Oh, you're a, you're a preterist. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll, after the 69 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. Well, that's the 70th week. Oh, you're, you're a preterist. No, I'm not. That's right. That's, that's the fulfilled view of Daniel 70 weeks. A friend of mine had a, had a guy come up to him at a conference and ask him, ask him, he said, uh, are you one of them there preterist? <laughs> <laughs> and so <clears throat> he had no clue what it was. He just heard this label through yeah. out about preterist he, he didn't even pronounce it right he called it a a preterist that reminds so me I, of, wrote a, I wrote a blog based on that that that's said hilarious if you're going to reject a doctrine or someone's view the first thing you have to do is be able to pronounce it <laughs> you got to be able to enunciate the words you got to be able to spell it and you got to be able to define it if you can't do all three of those then you probably shouldn't criticize a guy yeah yeah that reminds me of a time uh my dad he was uh he played music played uh, country and Southern rock music. And they had a band that played around Arkansas in the South. And they were at this uh, convention for the governor at the time, governor Jim Guy Tucker. And one of the local state representatives, I mean, there was a bunch of politicians there. And my dad and the band are just kind of standing off to the side. And one of these local representatives walks up trying to be all cool. And he's like, Hey, you guys play any CCR? And my dad was like, yeah, what do you want to hear? And he goes, oh, uh, oh, I don't know, man. I don't even know who they are. I just heard somebody say that. <laughs> so this, this guy didn't even know what a preterist was. He just saw yeah, it in the book. Exactly. Are you one of them there, preterist? <laughs> preterist. So, my son drives a Prius. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So speaking of books, you have written 
um, three books, I believe. I have. Calling on the Name of Jesus, which is a book of, um, based upon your years of, of debating Church of Christ on the baptismal formula. Mm-hmm. And it's um, the oral, about the oral invocation of the name of Jesus by the baptizer at baptism. At the, by the baptizer. And then you have uh, written a book on women's hair. Yes, uh, have, Woman's Glory. And you have written a book um, on women preachers. Yeah, Great Was the Company of Women. Yes. So the, the first book I wrote is called um, Calling on the Name of Jesus, an Apostolic Apologetic of the Baptismal Formula. And it did stem out of years of debating on the baptismal formula. Um, <clears throat> and, when, and when an apostolic author says they wrote a book on the baptismal formula, a, a lot of listeners will roll their eyes and go, oh, another mm-hmm. book. On, I promise you, my book is not like every other book. It's, it specifically deals with the oral invocation of the name of Jesus by the baptizer. Now, I, I, I deal with uh, calling on the name of the Lord in Acts twenty two sixteen. I deal with Acts two twenty one, Romans ten, um, and I deal with the whole concept of con, you know confessing Jesus as the Son of God, as the Ethiopian eunuch did yeah. before he ever got into the waters of baptism. Yeah. But so I deal with the the concept of why do we invoke the name of Jesus in baptism? It's not just a practice based on tradition. Yeah. Invoking the name is covenant. Everything about salvation is covenant. You know, if my people, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, yeah, and that that transposes to uh, the name of Jesus in baptism. James two, do they not blaspheme the good name invoked upon over you? Um, so this whole the whole aspect of baptism in Jesus' name, the name invoked over us, communicating the remission of sins. Well, that's what the the first book is about. And um, without a let me say this, without a doubt, in my mind, I've read um, a number of books that apostolics have written on baptism in Jesus' name, and it is hands down the gold standard on the apostolic uh, theology of. of invocation of the name of Jesus. Well, I, I certainly appreciate that. And then uh, the second book I wrote <clears throat> was on um, women's ministry, you know, the place of women in the apostolic ministry. And uh, I wanted to approach that subject from a strictly apostolic point of view. So if you are not an Acts 238 apostolic, that this book will probably not appeal to you whatsoever because yeah. it's very um, oneness Pentecostal in its approach. So, yeah. it, so I'm not an egalitarian. I'm not a complementarian. And define you're those terms for our audience. Uh, so a complementarian uh, does not believe in women in pulpit ministry. They believe that men and women have complementary roles in the house and in the church. And as the husband is the head of the house, uh, so male leadership should be the head in the local assembly. So they don't believe in women preaching and a, and a to men. Is, is supportive <clears throat> and complimentary. It's not, it's not uh, on an equal level or f- uh, functioning in the same, same capacity. That's correct. And, and then so an e- egalitarian. It's, it's a complimentary role. When he's done preaching, she says, good job, honey. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, and, 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 you know, they, they believe that women can teach other women and yeah, women can or teach children or children, but they um, can't teach adult males. Right. In any um, capacity. Whatsoever. In any capacity, Bible study at the house, uh, street corner preaching and especially behind the pulpit. Yeah. So an egalitarian believes in equality for both men and women in the home and in the church. So they kind of blur the lines of husband and wife relationships, that there's equal authority, equal submission in the home, which I totally disagree. Mutual authority. Yeah, mutual submission and all of that. And then they they also believe the same in the ministry. So that what, what happens, though, is you kind of get these umbrella definitions and, and you say, well, if you believe in women in ministry, you must be an egalitarian, yeah. which is not the case. Yeah. Uh, 
or if you don't believe in women in ministry, you must be a complementarian. Or if you believe anything, you know, kind of like with eschatology, oh, you believe Daniel 70 weeks is fulfilled, oh, you must be a preterist. Yeah. yeah, so if you believe, let's say, uh, the head of the woman is the man, that you, you hold to the traditional view that that means that the husband is in a position of authority over his own wife, well, that's the complementarian view. You must not believe a woman in ministry. Well, that's yeah. not the case at all. So my book is apostolic. What I believe is apostolic. And it's, it's neither egalitarian. It's neither complementarian. It's strictly apostolic. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do. Did you coin a phrase for your kind of third position or? I just call it apostolic thing? theology. Okay. Uh, a, a view of women in ministry. Uh, women in ministry in apostolic theology or something of that effect. Um, you need a you, you need to coin a phrase for it so we can have, yeah. a, have a shorthand way of referring to it. And then I'll copyright it, and That's every time point. someone uses it, I'll get a nickel. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of the things I wanted to do was <laughs> examine some of our apostolic writers on the issue of women in ministry. This is what I'm. This is what I'm talking about. Even going back to what I said earlier. The idea that that we should engage each other in, yeah. in charitable uh, disagreement, even in academic writing, and and man, so many of our guys are so uncomfortable. Our our egos are so fragile that if anybody were to cite our work to to reject it or to present an opposing view of it, we become entirely offended by that. <clears throat> Yeah. Well, and one of the problems I ran into is honestly, there's not a lot written against women in ministry from yeah. oneness authors. They'll say it over the pulpit, but they will they'll say it at dinner. Yeah. So, but I found a few things. So I've, I quote some stuff in there, but I'm respectful in the way that I did it. Absolutely. So, so that's uh, great was a company of women and apostolic theology of women in ministry. And I, I leaned into it heavily whenever I was teaching a series here at the church I pastor, Point of Mercy. Um, I cited it extensively in my, I think I did three weeks, three Sunday mornings that I, I taught on women in ministry in our adult Sunday school. And I had the same thing happen with uh, Bishop Vasquez, Jonathan Vasquez. If I'm I'm probably butchering his <laughs> the pronunciation of his well, last Vasquez name. Vasquez is, is how... Uh, I believe it's pronounced, but he, uh, he's one of the bishops in the ALJC and <coughs> he pastors down in, I believe he's the assistant general superintendent. And he pastors down in uh, Potts, Potts Camp, Camp, Mississippi. He's also a student at UGST, which is where I met him. And you, uh, uh, you guys have been in classes together. Correct? We have, we have, and I've preached for him. He's, he's yeah. a great guy. You taught uh, baptismal formula there, correct? No, I taught on um, hair. Oh yeah, the women. He was doing a series on um, holiness, and it was after I'd had the debate with Bishop Hayes. So Brother Vasquez asked me to come down, and Potts Camp is like a two-hour drive from my house. So we we went on a Wednesday night, and I taught on First Corinthians eleven. Um, but he had told me last June we we weren't in class together, but we saw. I say last yeah last year in June, we weren't in class together, but we saw each other. He was like. Hey, I just want to let you know, um, I taught your book on women in the ministry. And he said that he had a class of about a hundred people. And when he started the class, he asked them, uh, how many of you believe in women in ministry? And in a class of a hundred or so, only three people raised their hands. Oh, wow. Then, uh, when he got a little started into the lesson, he said, how many of you blame Eve for sin, sickness, and all of the headaches in the world? And he said, a bunch of hands went up in the class. And to explain that, I, I start my book in Genesis, yeah. and the fall of man. And I explain, because you got to have a good foundation or you're going to get messed up on everything else. That's right. And so I point out that, uh, you know, when Eve ate the fruit, her eyes were not immediately opened. It wasn't until Adam ate the fruit. Paul puts all the guilt of sin on the man, not the woman. From Romans so, 5, by one man's so, sin. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, he, the world. and then even first Timothy, uh, the, the woman was deceived, but the man was not deceived. Yes. So he knew what was going on. He did it eyes wide open. Yeah. 
So when uh, Brother Vasquez said, when he got through that first lesson, he said, now how many of you blame Eve for all the sin and headache? He said, not one person raised their hand. And so by the time he got through the, the lessons and he was just, he said, I kind of just went point by point through your book. When he got done, he asked the uh, class of about a hundred people. He said, now how many of you believe in women in ministry? And he said, there was only one person that didn't raise her hand. And that was a, a older woman who was a convert from Catholicism. So she was probably still holding on to a, a priestly laity kind of concept. But, um, and then, and then you have, you talked about your hair book already. Yeah. That came out of the, the women preacher book. Cause I had the debate with Bishop there Hayes. A chapter in your women preacher book on hair. Yes. Yeah. It's naturally the longest chapter in the book. <laughs> the longest. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and, um, and it's completely uncut. You did. It not, is. Yeah. You didn't take anything <laughs> out of it. Um, so I had the debate with Bishop Hayes on the issue of head covering. We had a funny versus, moment in that debate too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, we put our hats on. <laughs> <laughs> he, <But I> did. <laughs> he, he challenged, uh, he challenged me to put a, a hat on in the debate. He, he bought me an Arkansas Razorback hat and Oh, challenged me to put it on too, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. You well, and you know knowledge. what? I had you my know, LSU hat on, that, I think. To to explain, because I had to explain to some people, they're like, why were you a little apprehensive at first to put the hat on? And for a couple of reasons. One, I don't like people telling me that I have to do something yeah. to prove something. I mean, that's yeah. a punk move. Yeah. You know, well, if you believe this, you'll really do that. Yeah. I don't have to do that whatsoever. And two, and you'll, you'll understand this from who the crowd was, because there were ministers that I respect in the crowd that uh, do not support organized sports yeah. and, pro and professional sports. Yeah. So I, I took it as kind of a ding toward them that he yeah. was asking me to put on a Razorbacks hat, Yeah, knowing that these these ministers that I respect preach against attending sports and not that I do, but so I, I kind of felt that that was a little disrespectful on that. But anyway, to prove that I unequivocally do not believe that the covering is a hat, a scarf or whatever. So I, I put the hat on, you put your Cubs. I think I put a, it might've been an LSU hat it was either, well, we can go back and review the, uh, yeah, yeah. Footage. it was either Cubs or LSU. Yeah, and I even I even told him I tilt it sideways to have my little gangsta going on it. But. <laughs> so out of that debate, uh, one of the ministers there in particular, uh, the shortest minister there, <laughs> walks up and and says, "Brother Weatherly, you got to put all these charts in book form." Yeah. So I took the uh, the chapter on hair from the woman preacher book, and I just expanded it. I've lengthened it. Yes. And I let it, I let it grow. It grew, it grew a little, didn't it? Yeah. I, and I added way more uh, academic research to it than what I had put in the completely the unveiled. It's, <laughs> and it's got 99% of the charts that I used in that debate. You know, the ones that are not in particular, you know, where you have the proposition and yeah, defining yeah. the terms, none of that stuff. A whole lot more stuff in it. Um, and then again, I quoted, specific references because there's some brethren, some UPCI brethren up in Canada that teach head coverings. So I reference a book by one of those brothers. I quote Bishop Hayes's book. And then there's an entire head covering movement. Uh, I think also out of Canada. And I, I quote that guy's book. So and a lot of Hispanic apostolics are yeah, uh, pro second covering or artificial covering or whatever the terminology is. Well, and that so, debate was live streamed over Facebook. Yeah. So there were people connecting through Facebook as the debate was going on. Yeah. Most of my debates are on uh, YouTube. And your YouTube channel. Can you shout out the, the handle for your. Just look up uh, JLW515. That yeah. should be it. Uh, and and, and so, you, have, you have a bunch of great content there. Um, uh, most of your debates are there. You even have. Uh, Ferguson. Uh, I do. Uh, what was the who? Who's the guy he debated? Park Rider. 
Park Rider, that's right. Ferguson Park Rider debate there. Some great debate content there. So to in- explain real quick who Ferguson is, uh, I got, so I, I mentioned in 92, 1992, I got, went to see my first debate uh, with Billy Lewis. Um, I didn't know who this guy was at the time. So when I started digging into debates, uh, then I met Elder George, C.E. George from Jonesboro. He and I hit it off. He was, you know, a big contender for debates. He gave me some writings, some of the old uh, mimeograph, you know, the, you'd have to do it on the carbon paper and it would copy from the carbon paper. These homemade Bible studies by Paul Ferguson. And Paul Ferguson was, I had no idea who this guy was. He was a UPCI preacher in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. Uh, he was probably one of the first academic oneness Pentecostals. He had two master's degrees from Wheaton College, and then he went on to earn a PhD in religion from uh, Chicago Theological, some college out of Chicago. Um, and then he kind of uh, just kind of stepped off the scene to focus on teaching college. He was the Old Testament professor at uh, Christian Life College, I think it is, outside of the Chicago area. Um, but he was the debater back in the, the late 60s, 70s, and, and 80s, and just a scholar. The guy was I could read. Hark, was it in that Hark Rider debate that the guy asked him, where did you get that translation from? And he yeah. said, I translated it myself. Yeah, I translated it myself. And he goes, and, and tell me, and tell me why my translation is not good. And full uh, so he to yeah so ferguson you know he could translate hebrew Uh, he was matter of fact outside of the the oneness ranks he's written articles for uh international uh standard bible encyclopedia he's got a an article in a a, some big thick book on the existence of god so he's done a lot of things or he did excuse me he did a lot of things outside of Mm. the the oneness ranks so when I found out who Ferguson was, this is back before the internet, and I just found his phone number and I called him. He still had the same phone number in Elgin, Illinois. I called him. We talked on the phone. He sent me a box full of things that he had written. Um, he would print debates. He would have an oral debate, then he would print it on you know, the old hammering typewriter on yeah. the carbon paper. So... Uh, and the thing is, you know, the old, old debates are all on cassette tape. Yeah. And these things are going to get lost. Yep. So a, a good friend from Texas, Robert Fenner, sent me a box load of debate tapes. And right off the bat, I started uploading these. Digitizing uh, them. Yeah, digitizing the, the Paul Ferguson debates and putting them on YouTube. Uh, and oh, man, the, that's, that's amazing to have that, to be preserving that incredible piece of yeah. of academic apostolic history. Speaking of books, I am going to shamelessly plug both of mine right now. Go ahead. Uh, from 2012, I wrote a book called Are You a Christian? Redefining Apostolic. And then uh, in December of last year, I released a, a book on divorce and remarriage that came out of a series that I taught to the church that I pastor. Uh, called Divorce and Remarriage, A Theology of Healing After Heartbreak, which uh, Brother Weatherly actually writes um, a piece in the front of the book um, for me and was one of the editors for the book. And so thank you for participating in the process of, of that book as well. And it's a, not an, it's one of the, another one of those of you that it's not a traditional kind of apostolic approach no. to divorce and remarriage. It's not, Oh, you must be innocent party kind of thing. Like we're talking. Yeah. About. yeah. Well, and it's, it, uh, it's another one of those books that brings up an issue that hardly anyone talks about over the pulpit. You know, we'll, we'll talk about it at dinner dates or in fellowship circles, but no one wants to bring it up. And they um, definitely don't want to put their name on a particular articulate yeah. view about it. And it's, it's one of those books that even in the book I have, I made the invitation. Any of my apostolic brethren that don't agree with this, this 
the view that I espouse in this book, please take the opportunity to, to write a rebuttal, write a review, do a YouTube video <clears throat> articulating why and what's, what's wrong with the book, because I, des I definitely want this to be something that the movement engages in public conversation about the topic, because not just for my situation, but for many apostolic um, pastors and um, whether they have been divorced and remarried themselves or whether they are dealing with it in their congregations, this is, a, I think, a topic that we desperately need to rethink our approach on. Well, and, and it's not whether they're dealing with it in the congregation. Yes. They are dealing with it in the congregation. Yeah, about it. And we've acted like divorce and remarriage is the taboo issue that doesn't occur everywhere, but it does. And it's not new. No. It may have been swept under the table under, over the years, but if, if Moses is having to deal with it in the law, yeah. it's not a new issue. No. If Paul's having to deal with it in the Corinthian church, it's not a new issue. It's not new to the Christian community. It's not new to Pentecostals or apostolics. Not at all. And not at all. We, we've both had to go through licensing, the licensing process for our respective organizations. I'm ALJC. You just uh, got licensed with the United Pentecostal Church. Yeah. And so for both of us, it was a rigorous process because we have both yeah. been divorced and we're both remarried. And yeah. so it was, a, it was a very real world scenario for, um, for, for both of us, not just personally in terms of how we live out our private lives, but in terms of what it looked like for us to, to join, you know, apostolic organizations. And so I definitely think that it's a, a, a topic that needs to be talked about movement wide. Yeah. And I understand the, uh, the, the idea of why you need all of this paperwork yeah, to be licensed because it, it is a very high calling. It's, it's a holy calling. Uh, but just to give an illustration, it took me two years to gather all the information to be able to present uh, a complete application. My application was probably about a hundred pages. Um, and then you have to try to contact people from situations that happened 15 years ago. Yeah. And ultimately um, the only way that I could get licensed was I, I ended up having to contact the adulterer yeah. and have him write one of the adulterers and have him write a letter. And uh, I had to stand there face to face with him to receive this handwritten or hand signed letter from mm -hmm. him. And when it was all said and done, he looked at me and he said, man, I'm, I'm sorry. I never meant for anything like that to, you know, to, to have went that far to destroy so many lives. And I, I want you to forgive me. Yeah. And so I, I told him, yeah, I, I forgive you and shook his hand and walked off. Uh, Cause what well, happened 15 and, years and, ago is, is done. And I understand the carefulness that organizations go through to want to preserve the integrity of ministry. And yeah. You don't, you don't want some guy who, some preacher who is a serial adulterer himself, you know, you don't want to place that endorsement on them by um, giving to them license. And so I understand the whole yeah. need for carefulness, um, but, but it's certainly a topic I think we need to, to um, uh, take another look at in, in the apostolic movement. So. Uh, both of our books are available on Amazon, uh, both in print and in Kindle format. And so if anybody wants to purchase any one of these five books, then uh, all you have to do is uh, search for them on uh, Amazon and they are available there. And I definitely, uh, definitely recommend that you buy and read Brother Weatherly's book, uh, books, my books, just buy it. I don't care if you read it or not. I don't <laughs> No, I'm teasing. Definitely, uh, uh, definitely uh, read them. Well, you know, I, uh, one of the things I've said all throughout my ministry is that uh, I, I don't necessarily have to be the conference preacher. I'm not saying I don't want to be a conference preacher. I mean, so yeah. if you want to invite me to come preach your conference, that's great. I'll be ready. But I, 
I'd rather be the guy the conference preacher quotes. Exactly. So when you write something and then you start having it quoted, yes, that's like validation. You're like, yes, now your writing is being used as an academic source. And to um, me, that's to me that's way more valid. And I've I've preached a no, uh, a number of con- a lot of conferences over the years. And to me, uh, having somebody engage with my work is way more validating than being invited to speak at a conference. Yeah. Even if somebody engages either one of my books to say, "Hey, this is what this guy said, and here's why I don't agree with it." That, man, that's that's either incredible. Way, yeah. Well, yeah. I would love to see, uh, especially my baptism book, be used as a textbook in oh, it, there, college it's, courses. It's a matter of time if it hasn't already. It's well, it's hopefully, uh, I I teach Purpose Institute at our local campus, uh, I, and I do teach the every time it rolls around. I teach the Godhead lessons, I teach the water baptism lessons, and then uh, for the past year, I've been teaching online for Harvest Bible College in Glasgow, Scotland. Matter of fact, my wife and I are going to Glasgow. If it's still uh, on the books for next year, uh, we're going to go in March of next year and I'm, I'm teaching on Jeremiah, but I'm hoping that I can talk to brother Kelly and through Harvest Bible college, maybe uh, kind of just mention using my book as one of the textbooks for uh, whatever class they have on theology for the, the first year students. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's an absolutely um, incredible, incredible book. So it, it's just, a and I've of- recently updated it. Uh, the book, of course the book was first written in, in January or uh, 2010. Uh, my son Cole was born January of 2010 and I wrote the book throughout the remainder of 2010. I, I wrote the book late at night or early in the morning, holding my newborn son in one hand while I'm hunting and pecking on the keyboard with the other hand, uh, <laughs> trying not to disturb my wife's sleep. Um, and so then I, I self-published it at the end of uh, 2010. And to me, the baptism book, because that's you know just one of my sugar stick uh, teachings, one of the things I love. So it's always been kind of a, a work in progress. I wanted to reformat the the notations, especially now being a, a graduate student and learning new uh, types of style of, of research and the SBL format and all of that. So I went back and I changed it from end notes to footnotes and put it more in SBL format. And then I rearranged the chapters in the front. So it has more kind of a progressive flow from the baptismal formula to the history of baptism instead of starting like I originally did, just jumping you right into the history of the baptismal formula controversies. And then I've even added some of the charts that I've used over the years in debate and um, in teaching purpose Institute. So if you bought a copy of calling on the name of Jesus between 2010 and 2019, uh, thank you for your support, but there's an even better updated version of it on Amazon right now. And so it's like the fifth, the fifth printing of the book. So uh, I need to go buy a updated physical copy of that. So I guess, so I can see the changes. And, and uh, so uh, of the three books that you've written, which one are you um, when you read yourself again, as you, I know you do because I know I do. I pick up my book. Yeah whether the physical copies or the Kindle editions. And I will occasionally read back through them, especially when I'm, I've been interviewed a number of times recently on various podcasts. And one of the interviews was um, exclusively about this book right here, which you can see on my YouTube channel forward talk, which we are on right now. There's a, um, uh, an episode where we talk about that book, but in preparing for that book, uh, preparing for that interview on that book, of course, I'm I'm reading back through it uh, to refresh my own mind on what I said. <laughs> yeah, but obviously, you don't remember every word of what you said in a book that you wrote, right? Uh, and there's po- points in that where I'm I'm reading and I'm like, oh my god, that that's good stuff right there. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know what I mean? 
It's like, yeah, who this guy yeah. is, this guy, this guy's nailing it, right? Oh, that's me. <laughs> yeah, which yeah. that's I, I tell people like on the so the hair book, I it, with it being the the most recent, uh, and also, you know, when you say you wrote a book on baptismal formula or women in ministry, again people will, will roll their eyes and go, oh, another yeah. book. We've got plenty of books at the Pentecostal Publishing House. You look up books on the hair issue, 1 Corinthians 11, they're going to be few and far between. Absolutely. And, and no slam to the previous authors, Dr. C. Graves, uh, Sister Jowalski, I think is what her last yeah. name is. There's, there's several books out there. Um, Sister uh, Lori Wagner, who's a friend of mine, I've had classes with her at UGST, she and, and uh, Sister Gwen Oaks, which I knew personally, uh, Sister Oaks was the head over women's ministry for the, the UPCI, and um, she was, she and her husband pastored in Batesville, Arkansas for years, and then they moved to uh, Grace Point Church in BB uh, just before uh, Brother Oaks and Sister Oaks passed away. I, I, I attend church with Sister Oaks's son, uh, Matthew. Anyway, they wrote, all of those people have, have written great books on the subject of, of First Corinthians and hair, but none of them are, are a very, none of them are like what I would consider an academic. It doesn't yeah. dig deep enough, I don't think. And mine takes a verse by verse academic systematic theology approach to it. And I'm also, I'm examining what not only what some of our oneness brothers have said, but what uh, other people, I deal with the veil issue. I deal with cut or uncut hair. Um, and, and then uh, the history, the history of how the early church taught those things. So I do the same thing when I'm reading that book, because I've told people you need to buy a woman's glory. I'm not telling you because I wrote the book, but I'm telling you because, or I say, uh, I'm not telling you this because I wrote the book. I'm telling you because I wrote the book. You know, I've read it. And when I read it, I'm like, oh man, that's good. Yeah. Who is this guy? Oh, that was me. Oh, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> so, so of the three books, which is your favorite? Uh, well, my favorite's always going to be calling on the name of Jesus. Because it's the the baptismal formula is my favorite. my subject. I I, my, I I love that subject. But laying aside your favorite topic, just simply in terms of the case you made or um, the writing and and presentation, which which book is your favorite? Uh, a woman's glory. Yeah, I, I think it's a much needed book uh, in in Pentecost. Um, and, and I'm not done. There's some, I've got some other books that I'd love to, to write, write on later the, on. The cessationist topic, right? Yeah, I would, matter of fact, when I'm looking toward a PhD program, um, I'm probably going to be looking to defend a thesis on, um, continuationism or the, you know, the right. idea that the oh, gifts are still and present and in the study program at the renewal studies doctorate at Regent. <laughs> well, we haven't, we haven't quite uh, committed to Regent yet, but that oh, would be one place that that's still like an option. Oh, that's yeah. That's still an option. I've, I've talked to uh Regent about that and they are the renewal studies is kind of a, it's a, a that Pentecostal would be leaning. Yeah. yeah. That would be in your but where. Yeah. So wherever I, I do my PhD studies will be, I'm hoping that, my thesis will be on the subject of uh, the gifts, the modern day operation of the gifts. Well, I'm I'd also to, like to write. I'm rooting for you to join me at Regent. Yeah. Well, and uh, also uh, another one of our brothers, I think has just recently been accepted to Regent in the undergrad uh, program. And there's several who is, uh, who is of that? our, Brian, I think Brian's been accepted. I think he applied and accepted. I don't want to say, I got you. Say, I got you. But, Cause I don't know. Brian's a generic I mean, name. Yeah. Everybody. Knows. Yeah, he has. He yeah. sent so, me, he sent me the uh, screenshot. Yeah. He has good been, deal. Yeah. He's has been accepted. But and, if, and, if you look at a lot of our apostolic scholars, 
you're going to see that several of them have Our graduated region. from a region. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I'd also like to write something on eschatology because I don't know of a, a oneness writing that has a non-dispensational view. Maybe that's one of those projects where we could, you can write your own book, but maybe there's one of those projects where we can do like a, a two apostolic, two views book yeah. from an apostolic perspective where. Yeah. We, we there's write plenty of books out there like that. Yeah. Three I, views I, on the rapture. Three yeah. views on the millennium, but so. it's never been done by an apostolic, two no. apostolic guys. No, there there is no such thing as two a two or three views book from an apostolic perspective. No. That would be so good. It too. would be awesome to, it would be awesome for uh, us to do that groundbreaking work together of doing a a multi views uh, book on eschatology. Yeah. Do your own. That's. That's amazing, but it would be cool to, to do a, uh, a, a group project, a group book on, on eschatology. And there's, there's a lot of, there, there are a lot of issues that I want to write about. I, I have a, um, I don't know, probably close to 200 pages on a, what I call a practical view of the oneness of God. Uh, mm -hmm. A ton of books have been written on the oneness of God, David Bernard has written classic oneness um, works on the oneness of God. But the approach that I'm taking uh, in, in this book is not necessarily the oneness versus Trinitarian technicalities uh, of the oneness of God, but uh, what does the oneness of God look like when it's lived out in, in everyday life? What are the practical implications uh, of the oneness of God, and I cover probably eight or ten different areas of 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 uh, practical life where the oneness of God uniquely shapes how we see the world. And so, that won't be just another book on the oneness yeah. of God either. Whenever I do that, I don't know that anybody, I don't know anybody who's ever written on the oneness of God from that perspective of. How is the oneness of God uniquely qualified to address these particular aspects of living? And another thing on, on validation in writing books is when you see your book or your friend's book at a conference. Yeah. So at, at Arkansas Camp Meeting, I, I sent you a picture probably I know, two years ago, and there it was. Are you a Christian by John Carroll? I'm like, look at there so at <laughs> Arkansas Camp Meeting. Well, one and of then, my favorite things about that book from 2012 is that um, brother Jeff Arnold, Bishop Jeff Arnold, personally ordered 80 copies of that book from me. Yeah, but they're all worthless. Do what? They're all worthless. I know. he. Uh, the, <laughs> the first one that he got, the first one that I, I actually gave him a book at a, at a meeting. And uh, he looked at he looked at me and said, uh, "Will will you sign this for me? That way it'll be worth yeah. it." One day. <laughs> yeah. But after that, he ordered 80, 80 copies after he got home. Yeah. Well, and uh, a good friend of ours out of Racine, Missouri, Steve Epley. Yeah. I'll get a text from him probably every four months. He'll say, "Send me ten more books." The so I'll send him ten books with hair. The baptismal formula book. Uh, right. He'll say, send me 10 more books and I'll send him books with an invoice and he'll, he'll send me a check. Or uh, at first I, I sold the books for a short time through PPH. Yeah. And um, yeah, PPH uh, carried, are you a Christian when it, I first released it in 2012? Go ahead. So then uh, I got a, um, I got an email from him one time, you know, about send us 15 books. And it was for one of the again, like so Tennessee um, camp meetings or something. Yeah. So we've been talking for a long time. We've heard the cuckoo clock twice now. Go ahead now. So I'm people, sorry. I had to mention the so, cuckoo clock. <laughs> the, uh, when I was first selling calling on the name of Jesus through the Pentecostal publishing house, one of the coolest things was that they sent me a special invoice of, you know, we want 15 copies of your book. And it was either going to like the Tennessee district camp meeting or the Kentucky district camp meeting, one of the two. So that was kind of like, yeah, that's I've sort of arrived. 
Yeah, it's um, it's it's a fun process seeing the places that your book shows up, seeing the people that tweet about it, that uh, you know, put it on social media that they just got your book in the mail. That's always fun to see that. Yeah, uh, yeah, that kind of thing show up online. I got a review on YouTube on uh, a woman's glory that the the guy that does the review he's he's not known to be very friendly in his book reviews. And so when someone sent me a, a link like, to the review, oh I was like, goodness. Oh man, but it was real good. He was, he loved the book uh, and gave me a, a really good review. And then uh, shortly after that, I don't know how many followers he has, but I had like this huge sale like. of books, it, even in Japan, people were yeah. buying and it wasn't the Kindle versions. It was like the hardback versions of, of a, a woman's glory being sold over in the, the Japanese market. Yeah. Uh, I was shocked the other day whenever I, I think I texted you a screenshot of it, of purchases mm -hmm. from uh, Japan on my divorce and remarriage book. It was, I was like, Whoa. Yeah. And of course UK sales and, and, but the Japan one, just like I was stunned by it. That, that one, I mean, just like good Jap Japanese judo, that one threw me. I, I wouldn't. I didn't. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, for. <laughs> anyway, I get tickled at my own jokes occasionally. <laughs> I tell my wife, because she has to remind me that I'm not a comedian. Yeah. And I tell her, I do my comedy for an audience of one. Exactly. And he thinks I'm hilarious. Exactly. If anybody else gets my jokes, it's just. I one of my favorite cake. things about my type of humor is watching people miss them. Oh yeah. Like either yeah. way I get extreme pleasure out of it. If you get it, I get pleasure out of it. If you miss it, I get just as much pleasure out of it. If you, if you don't. Yeah. But I love, I love messing with the, the cashiers. And one of my, my favorite memories of a dad joke is I'm with my son, Caleb and we're at Walmart. We're, checking out, you know, the cashiers, they've been trained to ask you, uh, would you find everything you're looking for? And yeah. as soon as they said that, um, oh man, I just thought of another one. I got to tell you right after this one. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, they said, um, I said, did you find everything you're looking for? And I was like, no, I didn't. And the cashier goes, well, what were you looking for? And I said, well, what I need is a droid that understands the binary language of moisture evaporators. But all I could find were those that were programmed for protocol and etiquette. And I have no need of a protocol droid. And she just looked at me with this blank stare and said, are you talking about a phone? And Caleb looked at me and he shook his head. He goes, dad, move along, move along. This is not the droid you're looking for. And I was like, yes, you got my Star Wars joke. That's awesome. Uh, but even funnier than that, I'm sitting in the, the Tahoe. I got my boys with me. And they were younger. Uh, these are all my, my, my grown men sons now, but they were, teenagers, preteens, and McDonald's had these nasty cheddar onion burgers at the time, but my sons loved them. So we're going through the drive through and we're ordering a bunch of these nasty cheddar onion burgers. And I know what they're going to do. They're going to park you, right? Yeah. They're going to make you walk, you know, pull up and park. So I pull up, park, I got the window down and I see the guy out of the mirror walking up with the bag and I look at my sons and I'm like, watch this. Cause I know what the guy's going to say. He walks up with the bag. He says, sorry, for here's your order, order, sir. Sorry about your weight. And I looked at him and said, my weight, what is that? Some kind of fat joke. Are you calling <laughs> me fat? And he's like, Oh my goodness. No, I'm talking about your, your W a. And I said, dude, it's spelled the same way. And he goes, uh, no, it's not. And I was like, I know I'm just kidding. It's okay, dude. <laughs> i'd lost 113 pounds in nine months and wow time, and you actually lost quite a bit of weight doing the same thing Yeah, i lost 70 but it all found me back <laughs> and then uh but i would use that joke at a drive through they would say sir sorry about your weight i'm like i'm down 50 pounds right now i'm doing my <laughs> best i can about this <laughs> they'd always like yeah. Oh man, thank you so much for taking the time this morning to uh to talk on forward talk and to um to to have these conversations with me today and it won't be the last time that we do it. And um 
Uh, I can't wait to. The wait. next one needs to be in person, though. Absolutely. Absolutely. We definitely need to have an in person. And when, whenever we do get you up to, to uh, Ohio, and I promise you, we will, you understand the circumstances uh, connected to our, not cancellation, but postponement oh, yeah. of yeah. you coming up here, but we are, we're definitely going to do it. And when we do, we will sit down uh, with uh, good mics, good cameras, and uh, we'll, we'll do a fun episode. And we, we may even, um, we may even have a little friendly back and forth over our points of disagreement on eschatology sure. or something of, of that nature, just to uh, provide some, some entertainment for the people that watch, but dude, massive respect and love for you. Uh, appreciate your friendship. Um, nothing but respect for your scholarship and, and, and your work. And so thank you so much for, for uh, coming on the program this morning and, and having this conversation. Well, thank you for the invite and equally back at you, the love and respect. John Carroll is one of my favorite evangelists. He's one of the few evangelists I uh, would drive two hours to go here preach. Speaking I've of done you, that on, on speak, several occasions. Matter, speak, matter of fact, lo- further than that, because I drove to Jackson, Tennessee to hear you preach one weekend. Yes, you did. And add that Jackson, no, Jack's Creek, Tennessee, right? No, Jackson. No, Jackson. Yeah, that Donald Lance. Lance. Yeah. But you came to Jack's Creek that time, too. No, it was at Brother George's or at Jonesboro. You and your wife. Jonesboro, were, yeah. At Brother Robinson's yeah. in Jonesboro. And I was preaching, and you leaned over and like looked at your wife and said something to her about the message. And I was, and I read your lips, and I'm like, "That's right, Jason." And I repeated, <laughs> I repeated what you said. <laughs> and awesome. you were sitting like 75 percent of the way toward the back of the church, and I think you were mildly freaked out that I, that I nailed exactly what you said by reading your lips. Yeah, because I can't read lips. I, I've coined the term, um, "I'm ill lip literate." <laughs> <laughs> so I can't read lips for anything. Well, I can well, thank read. you again for having me on, uh, dude. I love you. Uh, and this has been a great week. We could go on for another four hours, but it would wow. snooze people to death. Uh, absolutely. And, and we will, we will definitely do this and I'm going to, to uh, close out this the way I do with all of my recent episodes. And that is Jason, thank you for joining us on this uh, episode of reversing the silence through forward talk. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, brother.